It's so easy to act presidential, but that's not going to get it done. With the exception of the late, great Abraham Lincoln, I can be more presidential than any president that's ever held this office. That I can tell you. That was President Trump in Ohio this week, and here to take that on. And all of this wild week in Washington is our powerhouse roundtable. ABC News political analyst Matthew Dowd, Republican strategist and ABC News contributor Alex Castellanos, Julie Pace, Washington bureau chief for the Associated Press and ABC News congressional correspondent Mary Bruce. Welcome, everyone. We say this all the time, but <laughs> what a week, what a week. So I, I, I want to start with you, Julie. Reince Priebus. Let's go to Reince Priebus, one of the shortest serving chiefs of staff in history. We now have John Kelly, former secretary of DHS, or maybe he lasts till Monday, retired four-star Marine general, kind of guy who you think can bring order to that White House. But, but what does this tell you about this White House and the direction they're taking? Well, I think what it tells us first is that the president recognizes that he needs a new direction. And I do think that that's an important step for this president because he is someone who very rarely admits that he has made a mistake or that things are not going as smoothly as he would like to portray. The challenges, though, for Kelly are many. There is the challenge of getting a White House that thrives on infighting. The people who are in there are there uh, to some degree because they want to promote their own interests, and those interests diverge often. And then the second challenge that he has, and, and we have seen other campaign chairmen, other advisors try to solve this, is to get Trump to be more disciplined. When the White House comes up with plans, when they come up with a messaging strategy for the week, it can be washed away with one 6 a.m. tweet. And if Kelly is not able to resolve that. We're basically going to be dealing with a very similar situation come but, fall. But, but but just choosing John Kelly, does does that tell you they really that the president really does want to change things up? Or does he just want a guy in there who says, yes, sir, Mr. President? I think it does send a message. He's choosing someone who comes from the military, who understands a chain of command, who has run a pretty tight ship at DHS right now. But again, the problem for Kelly is not going to be his own implementation, his own strategy. It's going to be, can he get the staff and the president to go along with it? And, and, and Matt, let's just remind everyone, since the beginning of the administration, I really had to write this one down. There are so many. Uh, the following Following key personnel have all been fired or have resigned. National Security Advisor Mike Flynn, FBI Director James Comey, White House Communications Director Mike Dubke, White House Press Secretary Sean Spicer, and now White House Chief of Staff Reince Priebus. That's in just six months, just a little over six months. What, what do you think needs to happen to stabilize this administration? <laughs> Fundamentally, uh, the captain of the ship needs to change, um, change either behavior or a change in entire manner with which he does this. The idea that they keep replacing somebody that's on an oar in a ship that's pulling one of the oars and they're going to somehow change the direction of ship when some of the person at the wheel is, is steering it in all kinds of bizarre manner, I don't think it's going to change anything. And I think this idea that putting a general now in this chief of staff, there's been three generals in the administration and the administration has operated as the way it has since day one. Three different generals in three big, big powerful positions. Well, actually, there was four. One's gone, as you say. And nothing has changed. So I don't think this is going to change anything. It's another one of the pawns moved on the board, and Donald Trump is going to keep being Donald Trump. Alex, you look like you're itching to get in on this. <laughs> well, when you can't... Um, is there a disagreement there? When you can't fire the coach, you trade the players. And uh, I think Matthew, in that sense, is right about that. But look at General Kelly. Uh, Donald Trump brought him in... I think because he brings that sense of discipline. But it all depends if General Kelly is able to get Donald Trump into boot camp at Paris Island, if he's able to discipline the President of the United States. Now, you would think that if Trump brings someone in to do that job, he would let him do that job. But how Trump uh, embraces that discipline from Kelly is what's going to set the example for everyone else in the White House. So these first few weeks are going to be critical. Does that's an Donald and, and, Trump to, to, empower to, to, to Kelly? That's an amazing <laughs> statement, though, that you have to, you want to bring the president into boot camp to give him training. Yeah, and, and, to, and to Matthew's point, these other generals, some of them have been marginalized to a degree, and there's been friction with the other generals, with H.R. With McMaster in particular. So, so d d same question. Do you think he brought John Kelly in? Because John Kelly has been overtly supportive 
a real champion for Donald Trump well, since I he came I think he brought up. Kelly in for the same reason he brings in successful businessmen and he brings in other generals. He likes people who have accomplished things, who've been successful in other realms. And political guys aren't those people. The people who fail in Trump world are political people. The people who succeed are military and successful businessmen. That should be the way, the direction this administration goes. And, and, and Mary, you've been on the Hill all week. I think you did, did that all-nighter, <laughs> I suspect. <laughs> but before his firing, um, Reince Priebus, House Speaker Paul Ryan came out to defend him. Republicans on the Hill also have come forward to defend Jeff Sessions. So, so give us a sense of what it's like on the Hill for Republicans to look at all this drama in the White House. There's a real sense that they are getting fed up, and I think you saw that this week, especially uh, after all of the fighting and, and the, the back and forth between the president and Jeff Sessions. And what's different this week is that a lot of top Republicans seem to be putting their foot down now. You heard Lindsey Graham, never one to mince words and, crit and you know, shy away from criticizing the president, but he came out and said, look, if President Trump makes any moves to fire Jeff Sessions or now to, to move him possibly over to the Department of Homeland Security, he says they will be holy hell to pay. And it goes Goes beyond just words. Would and that be a turning point, do you think? I think it would. And the difference is it is, isn't just words now. You are seeing Republicans like Chairman Grassley of the Judiciary Committee saying, if the president thinks he's going to get a new attorney general appointed this year, forget about it. He says they don't have the bandwidth. And he said, no way. That simply would not happen. And, and Julie, we saw the jaw-dropping interview with Scaramucci and, and the New Yorkers, Ryan Lizza. What effect does that have in that White House right now? I think everybody was watching and thinking, oh, who's going to go? Is it Reince? Is it Scaramucci? Because he said all those things. And, and, and again, that sort of, we asked John Carl this, but the, the relationship between Bannon, Scaramucci, how do you see that all settling out? And what does John Kelly do about it? The effect of Anthony Scaramucci's arrival in the White House has been pretty amazing. I mean, he came in there. He's ostensibly the communications director. And in his one week on the job, he was acting like the chief of staff. And he was talking about firing people, not just in the communications shop, but going after senior advisors as well. I think the dynamic in the White House is, is this right now. You have a new chief of staff who's going to come in to bring some order. You have a communications staff that is reeling, even with a new person at the helm there. And then you have these other power centers, Steve Bannon, who uh, remains someone who can remind Trump of the base that elected him, but is lacking in broader power. And then you have the family. And the family is really where the power resides. That dynamic between John Kelly trying to right this ship and the Trump family, I think, is going to be the real dynamic to watch here. And, and Mary, I just want to go back to you and, qu and quickly on health care and what that was like to watch for you, to watch John McCain, that stunning moment. And what do they do next? You heard Tom Price. You heard a, a lot of rhetoric this morning. What happens? Well, they really don't know what comes next. And I think Republicans that I've talked with insist that this fight is not over. And politically for them, it can't be over. This is their signature promise to the American people. They have to find some way to get something done here. So you sort of see two camps. I've talked with some Republicans who insist that they still have some legislative options left, although that's hard to see how, given that this skinniest of skinny repeals can't even get through the Senate. And then on the other side, you are hearing some Republicans now say, look, it's time to go back to sort of the beginning of this, let's let's have regular order, let's work with Democrats here. But the one thing that everyone seems to agree on is that they don't know the path forward. I mean, I, I was talking with Tom MacArthur on Friday, the uh, Republican who helped push this effort through the House. When I asked him what comes next, he just looked at me and he said, I am not a prophet. I do not know what comes next. I, I now want to turn to another event this week that's getting a lot of attention. Uh, President Trump spoke to law enforcement and had these words for them. Like when you guys put somebody in the car and you're protecting their head, you know, the way you put their hand over. Like, don't hit their head and they've just killed somebody, don't hit their head. I said, you can take the hand away, okay? And the comments are pouring in from police departments all over the country. The New York Police Department to suggest that police officers apply any standard in the use of force other than what is reasonable is irresponsible, unprofessional, sends the wrong message. Boston Police Department, as a police department, we are committed to helping people, not harming them. The statements go on and on. Seattle, Philadelphia, Houston, New Orleans. Matt Dowd. 
Uh, I, it's it's hard to believe that I can continually be shocked by the president's behavior, but I am continually shocked by the president's behavior. First, there's so many people around the country that intersect with law enforcement that already have this fear that they're going to be mistreated, and how the police are going to act towards them, and the idea that he would celebrate that mistreatment is amazing to me. I think it's a broader problem where all of this stuff connects. His statements there, his statements at the Boy Scouts, his his empowering somebody like statement he politicized a Boy Scouts event, yes. and, the boy, and the head of the and, Boy and Scouts how had he to come out. In the midst of that, around a bunch of 17 and 18 year olds, and and Anthony Scaramucci being the and his behavior and being empowered in that behavior, Donald Trump has a bizarre view of what it means to be a strong person. A bizarre view of what it means to be a strong person in this society, especially a strong man. To me, Donald Trump and his actions are a weak person's idea of what a strong person is. The way you commit violence, how you act towards others, all of that. His idea of, 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 of a strong person is bullying people. His idea of a strong police officer is mistreating people that they, that they uh, apprehend. And so to me, it's a much broader sense. He has somehow been launched himself back in the 13th century about what he views as a strong person. A Alex, you can quickly comment on that, but I also want to talk about the, uh, the, his transgender tweet saying, that transgender people cannot serve in the military, blindsiding the military. Well, the only thing I'll say is that one thing we've learned about President Trump is that his supporters hear what he says differently sometimes than, say, we here in Washington. When he says, or you know, bang the their heads. <laughs> well, no, actually, a lot of the country thinks, uh, heard their president say, you know, these criminals, we have coddled them, we've been too soft on them, we have put uh, their interest ahead of keeping you safe, I'm on your side. That's what I think uh, Trump was actually trying to say. I don't think he was Killing literally saying, hey, let's bang people on the head. But we, we call that to, in the military, they call that in the military well, in command our, climate. In our overly sanitized culture, Donald Trump speaks like people. He doesn't speak like the elite in Washington. And a lot of America says, hey, he's right. On the a lot of America? <laughs> a, a good chunk of America, but uh, potentially a shrinking pool of America. Okay, thanks, all of you. I'm sure we'll have another wild week at some point, unless General <laughs> Kelly says. No more surprises, no. please. <laughs>